I'm the nominee of the Democratic Working Families and Oregon Progressive Party. Jessica's the nominee of the Republican and Independent Parties. Thank you. We shared our questions with the candidates about a week ago, uh, but they will have not seen the audience questions, which we'll get to about halfway through. So let's start with introductory remarks. Uh, we have asked the candidates to address these points in their introduction. Please introduce yourself and explain, particularly in relation to the top two or three environmental challenges you judge the district faces, why you are running for the Oregon legislature. Uh, candidates, you are welcome to either stand or stay seated. Uh, as you prefer, and we will start with Mr. Golden, and we'll rotate the first responder through the group with each new question. It's really the environment that pulled me into Oregon politics in the first place. When I first came to the state as a whitewater river guide and got involved fighting federal dam pro projects that turned free-flowing rivers into lakes, and uh, after winning one of those at Elk Creek with many of you, losing a couple, I, I lived uh, in the woods in Butte Falls, in th these parts of the counties, and uh, really was really appalled at the destruction of industrial forestry in the early 80s and decided to run for county commissioner, won that seat. Uh, worked uh, first to try to clean up the Medford Airshed, which was the second worst in the country at that time, with uh, some success actually curtailing wood stove use on foggy days, which was a little bit like imposing gun control in this valley. Um, uh, I went on to uh, uh, face a recall from the timber industry because when the Spotted Owl was listed, my point of view was that the 90s were not going to be like the 70s and the best thing we could do for people is to retool mills for smaller logs and to help workers make a transition to uh, other, other forms of employment. That wasn't universally appreciated. And with the help of some people in this room, we withstood a recall effort. And uh, I worked on a number of similar issues uh, in Salem as Chief of Staff to the Senate President. The last 20 years in my public radio and public television program, the environment has been a cornerstone of the work we've done, and more on climate and what we can do about it, what people around the country and the world are doing about it than anything else. And that, for me, would probably be the top environmental issue that sort of overshadows everything else. The others I put towards the top of the list are reducing toxic use and toxic sprays and trying to reverse the statewide preemption and ban that doesn't let other counties ban GMO crops. Uh, a whole nest of water issues, water quality and quantity issues, and resisting what I expect may be an onslaught, another onslaught, blast from the past, on our forests um, to try to get the last of the high value timber uh, with the excuse, supposedly, of uh, preventing fires. That's not the way to go about it. I hope we can talk about that in this forum. And I'd be thrilled to go to Salem to work on those and other environmental issues. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me back in the, in the far area? Thank you. So, uh, Jessica Gomez, I'll tell you a little bit about my history and what I do in my day job. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Rogue Valley Micro Devices. We make microchips, uh, do all of our manufacturing here in Medford. Uh, a couple of things that we make, we make a cancer diagnostics um, chip, so with one prick of blood, it will tell you whether or not you have cancer. That's going into clinical trials. Um, we make an air quality uh, sensor, a little bit ironic, over the past uh, last summer or two. Um, we also work with uh, graphene, which is a, the material you find in pencil lead. It's a new material that we're using in the microelectronics um, area, and it has wonderful properties. So we're really proud of the work that we do. My husband and I started a company 15 years ago. Um, we moved here to be close to family, raise our kids. Um, company was just the two of us, so we started with a bare floor. Um, and an empty garage, right, and, and worked really hard and put every piece of our facility together ourselves. Through that process, I really started to develop um, a love of entrepreneurship and really worked hard to understand what it is about our valley and how we can uh, 
be more supportive to building um, a more diverse economy. And I got involved with a, an organization that I started that was called uh, Sustainable Valley Technology Group. Um, and that was really successful. We ended up going to the state legislature and uh, meeting with lots of uh, people and, and raising money for that. I've served on a number of boards and commissions and I, I find myself here today and it's a big honor and I just, I love this community tremendously and I want to make sure that we're successful. I would say the two issues that we're facing here um, in the environment is the smoke and the fire year after year. And the other issue is water. Um, we need to think about water conservation and how we're going to manage our water in the future. This is on? Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm Pam Marsh. I'm the, ha the House representative for District 5. And just to orient you, since this is the first question of the night, House District 5 starts at the Klamath County border, includes the Green Springs, Ashland, Talent, Phoenix, a little corner of Medford as you turn, um, take a left trend, turn out to Jacksonville and Jacksonville and the Applegate. Now Michelle, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, has most of Medford. So that gets you oriented and you know uh, which one of us is, is an option for you to vote for. Um, I was elected two years ago to the House after four years on the Ashland City Council. And I served as a member of the Energy and Environment Committee this past two sessions. So I've been very grateful to have a front row seat on the work that we've been doing up there. I think we've had some good accomplishments. Um, Alan Bates would be so happy to know we did. We have regulated suction dredge mining, which is very hard on spawning salmon and an issue he worked on for many years. We saved the Elliott Forest thanks to leadership from the governor. Um, we got transit and electric vehicle subsidies into the transportation package. Those are all really big accomplishments, but guess what we didn't do and haven't done and has to be number one and that is significant climate legislation in 2019. We're gonna be talking more about that as we go on, but I would just note climate legislation isn't just the overriding cap and trade policy, which I heartily support, but it's all the pieces that we need to have in place, renewable subsidies and supports for businesses and individuals to um, put in renewable energy systems. We need to have regulatory reforms at the Public Utility Commission so that issues like climate can be factored into the formulas they use to set rate payers their agreements. We need to look at water. Um, Jessica is absolutely right. Water, uh, two weeks ago, 92% of the state was in drought. All right, water is a, an ongoing issue for us and one that is going to demand tremendous investment over the next few years. So those are the things I think we're gonna have to be looking at. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, well my name is Michelle Blum Atkinson and I'm running for House District 6. Yeah. And um, District 6 uh, encompasses most of Medford city limits, uh, excluding the manor. And this is the position that Sal Esquivel has had for the last 12 years. Um, he is retiring and so it's an open seat. Um, so a little bit about myself, I grew up here in Medford. I graduated from South Medford High School and went to University of Oregon, uh, where I studied journalism uh, and then also computer science. So I ended up actually working in software after I graduated and had a software company here in Medford called ProCare Software, where we developed child care management and accounting software. Um, I kind of got out of the business and something else was calling me, which was when the library that we're in right now actually was in the very real danger of being shut down uh, again. And so that's how I got involved in politics, uh, is trying to keep the libraries open, and we did it. And uh, that's why we're all sitting here today. Uh, and there are a lot of other problems here in Medford and Jackson County that really need to be solved. And you know, as a mom, uh, the air quality this past summer was just dreadful. Um, not being able to let my kids go outside and play was, was really hard. Um, but I know we're going to be speaking about that later on. So really, to me, some of the, the most important things are air quality, water conservation, and water quality. And then another thing that a lot of people are talking about in this district um, is the recycling or the lack thereof recycling these days. Uh, you know, you can only recycle, what is it, cardboard, milk jugs, newspaper, and aluminum cans. 
uh, I think we've gone backwards and we need to go forward on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And now let's start off with an easy yes, no question. So candidates, you have two paddles, a yes paddle and a no paddle. These are self-explanatory. <laughs> For maybe answers, please hold both paddles. And for I have no answer or I don't know, you hold up neither paddle. So the first yes no question is, are Oregon's regulations protecting environmental and human health generally too restrictive? Are Oregon's regulations protecting environmental and human health generally too restrictive? <laughs> Thank you. Now to the 90 second question format, starting with Ms. Gomez. Uh, the 2019 legislative session will likely be considering a proposal to address climate change with a bill that caps statewide emissions and supports sequestration efforts. What positions will, bring, will you bring to the discussions of such a proposal and why? So I think you're referring to the cap and trade or clean energy jobs um, bill. And, and this is the area where uh, my Jeff, my opponent, and I really differ. Um, I have two issues with this bill. Number one, it implements a really complex cap and trade system. And right now, I don't have a lot of confidence that the state can actually manage that structure, right? Uh, we tried in some ways to do something similar with the business energy tax credit. It was an absolute disaster. In fact, we had a lot of fraud and some people even went to jail over this. The other thing that I feel like is an issue here is that if we're really looking at reducing carbon emissions, which is what I would love to do, I don't think that this bill really gets there, right? In Oregon, we are 4 million people. Um, there are 7 million people on the island of Manhattan, right? Just to give you some scale as to what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about generating uh, $750 million um, per year. Uh, and we don't know how the money is, is actually going to be spent. Uh, you know, I think we need to start investing in, again, uh, water reclamation and water conservation. Um, I love the WISE project. I think that's a great use of funds. Um, also getting into our forests and doing proper forest management. And I don't see that this bill gets us there. I am and have been for a while a very strong proponent of cap and trade or cap and invest system. It was originally, that legislation was originally introduced in the state of Oregon in 2007. We've been talking about it and talking it to death for a lot of years and now we need to take a strong position and actually implement a bill that will get us to where we need to be next year. I want to note, cap and trade is nothing like the business energy tax credit. That was a tax credit that was run by the Department of Energy. There were completely different rules. A cap and trade system, just to recap, says that the state is going to put a cap on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions um, from the 100 biggest uh, emitters across the state. Over time, that cap is reduced, meaning that we can see a clear trajectory. Businesses have an opportunity to make the changes they need to be able to make to accommodate the cap and trade system. They can trade, they can buy those permits, they can innovate in ways that reduces their emissions. This is a market-based approach and the most fair thing we can possibly do. Otherwise, we're stuck in a regulatory system where we're doing whack-a-mole, and that's not fair to business either. So I am a strong proponent. Um, I served on a, one of the subcommittees that put together the cap-and-trade legislation that we considered in 2018. That was a short session. We were warned it would be hard to pass it in a short session, and guess what? That was right. Um, but as a result, we now have a joint committee that is being chaired by the House Speaker and the Senate President with the intention of starting with the legislation that we put together in 2018 and updating it, looking at transportation elements, looking at if we generate any sorts of resources, how they would be invested. Um, and we're going to come back with the very best possible year bill in 2019 and pass it. Uh, 
I am really looking forward to being a vote in support of the Clean Energy Jobs Bill. Um, this is a policy proposal that I think goes a long way in uh, really uh, curbing the, the climate changing uh, gases that we are emitting here in Oregon. And so uh, primarily it aims to limit pollutants uh, and then it also sets a price for polluters and gives incentives to cut emissions. And we really need that. And then the third part of this proposal that I am a huge fan of is that it helps invest in clean energy jobs, and clean energy infrastructure here in the state. So that gives us local jobs. So for instance, a lot of energy that we get from, say, coal, that's providing money out of the area and extra pollution that we don't need. So there's just so much to like about the Clean Energy Jobs Bill. I am very much looking forward to supporting it. Uh, and there's an analogy that I like that I've heard before is, you know, we don't let people just throw their trash in the street and expect someone else to pay for it. So why should we let the biggest polluters in Oregon pollute and then not pay for it? It doesn't make any sense and this bill does. I don't know of any responsibility more serious that we have than reducing greenhouse gases as quickly and as dramatically as we possibly can. Some say it's too late. I don't take that view. I do think that a rational society that was less had its politics less dominated by corporations would have started pricing carbon emissions about 30 years ago, about the time that Exxon was sending internal memos describing climate change and exactly what it would bring about. But we haven't had the political will to do that. I, I, I really have difficulty hearing uh, the position that we need to be studying this more or refining the system more. And it, it is complex and it is challenging to do this. Uh, the alternative is a lot worse. And we are falling in the path of California that has figured out carbon markets. Not perfectly, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. There are problems here. But we're not starting from scratch. And Oregon is a small state, it's true. It can now be part of the western front of California, Washington, at British Columbia to take on the national leadership that Washington, D.C. Uh, refuses to. We have to do this. It's very, very true that we got some tough questions to answer. What hasn't been filled in is who will be exempted from this? How big will the loopholes be for emitters? Exactly how will the money be spent? It's true, that isn't figured out. And how will economically challenge people be protected from the energy transition? because uh, that's, that's who usually gets hammered when there's a big transition. We can do this. Other states are generating clean energy jobs. There, there's, no, there's no other choice than to dramatically support this bill in my view. Thank you. All right. Now we will go to our second yes-no question. Would you pressure state agencies to deny permits for the Jordan Cove project. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, and back to our 90-second format again. Uh, our second question, starting with Representative Marsh. The recurring summer wildfires and smoke present serious health, recreational, ecological, and economic problems for the region. What would you do to address the complex forest management issues confronting Southern Oregon? Thank you. I think that there's one thing everybody in this room can agree upon is that it was a miserable summer for much of the time in the Rogue Valley. We had a month where businesses were hurt. Shakespeare Festival canceled 26 performances. We all walked around with masks trying to figure out who each other was on the street. Um, and in, in about the middle of August, I realized that we really needed to start having a community conversation about the complexity of this issue and the paths that we can take forward to adapt and mitigate the circumstances. And I organized, along with help from a wonderful team, a Smoke and Fire Summit that was held a couple of weeks ago, perhaps some of you attended. And what we did there was to, to begin to understand and talk together about the fact that there is no easy solution to this. 
Don't believe anybody who tells you they can do something overnight. This is a complex issue that's been developing over time. And what we need to do is, number one, we need to address forest management. I support the collaborative approach to looking particularly at the interface and making sure that our communities are safe as possible. We need to provide some support to businesses that are hurt, and we heard from the governor's office about some of economic development money that may be available to our community. We also need to look at things like air filtration systems and make sure we're in as good a shape as possible. We need to adapt our health and social services systems. We used to think shelters were only for the winter time. It's clear now we need to talk about shelters in the summer. And guess what? We need to pass climate legislation because all of this is being fueled by hotter and hotter years ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank Pam Marsh for putting on the summit, the Smoke and Fire Summit, uh, recently. That was super informative and a lot of great networking and, and meeting the experts on this topic. Uh, I just want to say, growing up here, this was one of the worst, smokiest summers I have ever seen. Um, not letting my kids go out was just really hard. Uh, I don't want them to remember summer as the time where they don't get to go outside and play. Uh, and I wanted to go outside and play too. <laughs> uh, so I've talked to a lot of firefighters and experts on this topic and really the general consensus of everyone is we can do more and we need to do more. We can go into the forest, manage the forest uh, in a sustainably, environmentally friendly way. We can clear the underbrush that is encroaching on the trees in the forests. We can uh, do prescribed burns that can really clear and, and help maintain healthy forests. So this is really about creating healthy forests, healthy trees, not clear cutting. Uh, that has really created a lot of problems is the clear cutting and then planting trees way too close together just creates uh, a recipe for disaster. So there's a lot we can do, and I really think we need to do more so we don't have summers like this every year. I keep hearing the question, was this summer smoke the result of climate change or poor forest management and fuel pelt buildup in the past? The answer is clearly yes. That's right, it is. We've talked some about climate. This is the urgency. It's not just that house is on fire. The Western United States has been on fire for months. Australia has been on fire. This is our version of climate chaos. And it's why we can't take forever to find the perfectly outlined detailed plan. We have to get going and we have to figure this out as we go on climate. And we have to do everything possible to prevent construction of the Jordan Cove pipeline, which only takes us deeper into this hole for another 40 years. Uh, the, the other part, forest management, is tough. It's going to be costly. We got all the financial benefit through the 70s, 80s, 90s, but we didn't put back and we didn't invest. We need to be um, reducing fuel, which is a labor-intensive process, with partnerships with the federal government, with uh, creative sort of conservation core, youth core pro programs where young people can spend a couple summers in the woods removing fuel in return for college or community college tuition. You give us two years, we'll give you four. And uh, we need, we're going to need to invest because as much as we would like to think that timber sales can pay for all the thinning, what we have found in the past is those sales tend to go after the undisturbed forest, the older growth that is not the wildfire problem. And we've been fooled about that again and again. So if we do private sales, we have to be meticulous in protecting the remaining parts of undisturbed forests that are not the problem. <clears throat> ah, the good old climate chaos. I have to tell you, that is scary uh, language that we use when we talk about climate change. Um, what I would like to say is, look, don't, don't let my opponent's language scare you about this issue. We are dealing with the tail end of an issue that started really in the early 80s and late 90s where we completely stopped getting into our forest and logging it, which I agree there was really some irresponsible logging going on with uh, the way they were clear-cutting our forests. 
Um, but what happened is we stopped allowing people to get in there and we left it alone and we also implemented or continued to implement fire suppression. And what happened, right? We got a lot of overgrowth, right? That now, 30 years later, um, we have now a thriving uh, economy with uh, travel and tourism. Um, I have to tell you, we have not been able to build up, rebuild our, our economic vitality when it comes to some of the manufacturing um, jobs and the wood product jobs that we have. So, look, what we really need to do is start working on this issue. We need to do some strategic lobby. I'm not talking about clear cut. We have the technology to get in there and pull out um, the, the sort of newer growth, clear out some of that underbrush, reintroduce healthy ground fire, and really start working our way out from, from our communities outwards. And over time, I think we'll see a big benefit in the reduction of smoke and fire. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and again, we'll do a yes-no format question. Hold the paddles high is the request. Not backwards. <laughs> Not backwards. <laughs> so, ballot measure 104. <laughs> this would require any proposal that raises revenue, including fees and licenses, no. to receive a three-fifths majority vote for approval. This would include fees for greenhouse gas emissions, such as those included in the Clean Energy Bill. Do you support this proposal? Raise them high. Thank you. And now our final 90 second uh, team question uh, from the SOCAN team. Uh, starting with Ms. Blum Atkinson. What components of your federal and state parties' environmental policies do you support? Which do you oppose? And how would you show your agreement or disagreement? Uh, so Oregon's Democratic platform uh, leads off saying, we know environmental protection is a cost-effective and essential for our survival. And, you know, we all know that this is a real critical issue. Uh, this is a life and death issue of protecting our environment. And so that is something that I, I do believe. Um, I believe in scientific peer-based study of this, this problem as well. Uh, in order to have a solution, uh, we need to be scientific. Um, I support an equitable transition away from fossil fuel. So this needs to be something that doesn't affect low-income people the most. This could be something that actually helps low-income people to build up and have more. Uh, nationally, I support Senator Jeff Merkley's goal of 100% clean and renewable energy by 2050, although sooner would be better. Uh, I oppose our country's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, um, and what it means is that states like Oregon need to be more proactive in defending our environment. Uh, I do not support the Jordan Cove pipeline, and that is something that not everyone in my party uh, opposes, but I think that um, it's too risky. The Jordan Cove pipeline is not something that Thank I support. You. Thank you. Uh, my parties are the Democratic uh, Working Families and Oregon Progressive Party. Uh, there is one plank near and dear to my heart in the Working Families Party platform. We fight for a just transition away from the global fossil fuel economy that guarantees working families' livelihoods for generations to come. That is not a pipe dream. Other states are ahead of us in doing that. The Democratic Party platform has 26 planks on the environment, which I am not going to read to you. Uh, and I didn't see any words I disagree with. They're all good, good goals, whether it's sustainable forestry, or protecting water, reducing toxics, it's things we have to do. But the words in platforms are not what 
improve uh, economies and improve people's lives. I'm more interested in how those intentions hit the ground in actual policy. And a really important example of that is the Clean Energy Jobs Bill. There will be a Clean Energy Jobs Bill that passes in 2019. The question is, what kind of a bill? Will it be window dressing, or it will help Oregon turn the corner uh, and become one of the national leaders on GHG reductions? I've, I mentioned the open questions, how, how are poorer people protected, who gets exempted, how does the money get spent? That's going to be warfare in the committees and meetings that are not on the Senate floor. And it is, a, to me, it is a perfect example of why it's so important to go to Salem independent of the pressure of special interest money in order to fight for our kids' environment. So as you can tell, uh, I don't really follow party line when it comes to our environment. Uh, I think our environment is precious and, and we need to do everything we can to protect it. I would say just in general, um, you know, the policies that I support are policies that are practical, that are pragmatic. What I don't like to see is policies that are designed to solve one problem that happens in a big city, right? And then it gets <coughs> implemented across the board. And then when we get to rural parts of Oregon and rural parts of our states, um, it doesn't work so well. So I think we need to be careful about how we implement policy and make sure that it's flexible enough to accommodate um, our rural areas, like um, areas of Oregon where we live. I don't support the Jordan Cove, so I want everybody to know that I've gotten questions um, across the board uh, from lots and lots of people that are really concerned about this issue. There are many reasons for that. One is, has to do with their environment. One has to do with, you know, we're taking um, Canadian um, gas and, and selling it to Japan, not thrilled with that. Um, and then, uh, you know, the imminent domain um, issues. You know, I really just want us to make some practical investments here. Everybody keeps hammering the, uh, the clean energy jobs bill. I kind of looked up on the internet. You know, we are at the, we're the bottom six in carbon emissions per capita, right? We're pretty good in Oregon. And I think what we need to do is allow legislation like our coal to clean to catch up. And I think we'll see really nice investments coming online from that. Thank you. All right. And wait, 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 Mimi. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll make it short. Did I cut you off now? <laughs> this is actually the time when I get to thank all of you because the reason we have this great Democratic Party platform that Jeff referred to is because there are members of you who have been willing to track up and sit in meetings and spend weekends really fighting for a platform that is powerful and speaks to these issues. So thank you to all of you for doing that. I support everything in the platform. I would note that the only issue that I think is not specifically called out is that issue of Jordan Cove. And we have some conflict in that in our party across the state. I am firmly against Jordan Cove, have been for since before I ran for office. Um, and that's an issue that we have to continue to talk about to really make it clear what the costs of Jordan Cove are from both an emissions point of view, from a landowner's point of view, from an equity point of view. Um, where I do disagree, I want to say, we have the, all these wonderful words. We have a party that's pretty good, but where I do disagree is the sense of urgency I have around these issues. You know, we've been talking about climate for 10 years, climate legislation, and I would say climate has gotten up into every, all of my colleagues' top five issues. So if you say, what are the big five issues? Climate will be there, but the problem is it can't be number five or number four or number three to get passed. It has to be number one or number two, because that's the amount of time and attention we have for big uh, efforts like climate legislation. So that's why we need all of you to keep talking about this so that it gets up and it stays at number one or number two among all the other things we'd like to be doing. Thank you. So uh, finally from the SOCAN team, our last yes, no question. Ballot Measure 105. This would repeal Oregon's 30-year-old law protecting the rights of immigrants. Proponents of Ballot Measure 105 are using environmental arguments to promote this measure. Do you support this tactic? This is a 
is an all-encompassing no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So that concludes the uh, SOCAN and co-sponsored team questions. And now we turn to audience questions that have been submitted as you entered. Uh, these have been vetted by our team members uh, to avoid duplication, to assure clarity, and to make sure they are on topic. And each candidate gets 90 seconds per question. We have five questions. So starting with Mr. Golden. This is our one and only planet, and there is no a way to throw things into. How will you address the problem of landfill versus recycling one-use items? The last part is landfill versus? Uh, yes, landfill versus Recycling one-use items. I'd like to broaden that a little to packaging, period, which is an unnecessary expense that doesn't serve anybody's well-being except perhaps the bottom line of certain package companies. So there are a number, you know, we, we have seen how to start down that road by incentivizing uh, people to uh, bring their own bags to places, and it's really caught on. I don't like paying an extra dime. I'm, I'm prey to that. I, I could make, put two cents on it, and I'll bring my own bag. So that, that's a beginning. I think, I think there's a lot of effectiveness there. Um, I'm, I'd like to think more about state legislation. Uh, with plastic bags, you're also talking about in, increasing uh, petroleum use, and we've talked enough about that today. So uh, if we could seriously reduce packaging in Oregon, which would be in the Oregon tradition of leadership, we started the bottle bill. Um, I, if, if we could see a legislative proposal to do that, I'd be, I'd be a strong supporter of that. It, it's very frankly not something I've thought about too much on this campaign. It is in my life when I p take you know 10 pounds of packaging apart for my one pound item. Um, but I, I'd like to study this more, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile, and I think some fairly simple incentives to business and to individual consumers can, can go a long ways. Yeah, reduce and reuse. I think we need to all think about that and help to educate ourselves and our neighbors about uh, what it means to take a plastic bag and, and reuse it and how impactful that can be. You know, we have a, an amazing company here in our valley called Road Disposal and they are doing some incredible things with, um, with uh, renewable natural gas. So they are taking garbage and are producing natural gas with our, with our garbage. And it's an amazing um, thing to have here and a great example of what we could do with some of our, our garbages. And, um, and what that might mean for our sustainability and our, and our resiliency. I mean, we might get cut off through a Cascadia event and having a resource like that could be um, really a, a wonderful and incredible asset to our region. So I would say um, support efforts like that I don't like seeing plastics and our garbage kind of going over to China and getting dumped into the ocean because we're not able to uh, bin our plastics properly. I think we need to pay close attention to um, what we put in our recycling cans at, at our homes. And there's technology that we can utilize to kind of help us get this done. So um, again, I think education is a big part of it. Working with our manufacturers is going to be um, a big deal too. Um, but I believe we'll get there. I was just sitting here reflecting on my memories of the first time I started recycling, and it was 1975, and it was in Palo Alto, and we'd take our cans and our bottles, we'd save them up for months, and then take them out to the Palo Alto dump where volunteers ran a recycling center. Probably many of you had experiences like that. Over our lifetimes, we've seen our ability to recycle become more and more sophisticated until we have these wonderful full use containers that will take everything that we throw into them. In some ways, we booby trapped ourselves by doing that because we made recycling way too easy. We started taking it for granted. 
And we got away from that very first principle, which is don't use so much stuff. All right? We decided if, if we could recycle it, it would probably be okay. So the, the crisis that we're having in our markets right now, where we're seeing recycling rejected from the foreign countries that have been willing in the past to take it, um, and rejected because we've been so careless in our own personal practices of recycling, um, is reminding us in a, in a good way of what we ne need to actually be doing. We need to be using less. I, I was, as an Ashland City Councilor, I voted in support of the plastic bag ban. Um, I think the community has uh, embraced that policy. I think, I think it was a good one. It certainly changed my own practices. I've learned how to juggle when I walk out of the store because I can't remember to bring those bags in. Um, and I think all of us, again, with this recycling crisis, have to take a close look at our own personal habits and what it is that we consume because that is the fundamental issue here. I remember reading a story about a woman recently um, who carried around a jar, and in that jar was all the trash that she had created in the last two years or something like that. And I just remember like being just taken away, taken aback by that uh, because of how much trash I make, uh, especially having kids <laughs> uh, and diapers. Um, you know, that's a lot of trash. And I know that I could be doing a better job, but what I really want is for it to be easier for people to do a better job, um, easier to recycle. I think a lot of people who maybe didn't recycle the proper way, I think most people were trying. They didn't know exactly what they were supposed to be putting in the red bin. Um, a sticker telling us would have been nice. Um, and so, you know, here in Medford, it is, it is really hard not to be able to recycle. You know, my four-year-old was just figuring out what she could put in there, and now I'm saying, no, you, you can't put in paper in the recycle anymore. You can't put in glass. Those aren't things you can recycle here in Medford. Uh, and I'd really like to bring that back. Uh, I think that we need to make it easier to recycle, and I would really like to get rid of plastic bags. Very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Audience question number two will be starting with Ms. Gomez. What is the state of Oregon's appropriate role in helping communities build climate resilience? Ooh, that's a good one. I feel like this is really more of um, a local role, right? Um, one of the roles of a legislator is you have your community leadership role and you really you want to back that up with good strong legislation and so I think it really starts in our communities building awareness talking about how we become more resilient and how we become more responsible um, having this conversation about recycling educating ourselves about um, you know what are some of the things that we can implement here locally that will have um, a larger impact and then when we go to the state finding ways to support those efforts. Well, clearly, I'm on? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, clearly, climate resilience has to happen at every level of government and in every part of our communities. I mean, the state has a responsibility, as I've said pretty forcefully here tonight, to set in place an overriding policy so that we can actually see some our greenhouse gas emissions begin to decrease over time. We also need to put into place some other structures um, at the state level to make sure that we're actually able to meet those emissions targets. And wherever possible, we need to support local efforts, but those can, are going to come out of our community. Some of you are uh, residents of Ashland where we have had a very active climate and energy planning process um, I was a part of initiating that when I, I was on the city council there because we understand that we need to take action in our own lives and in the context of our own communities. I think one area in which I do see a lot of overlap between the state and local levels is in our ability to empower local communities to develop um, their own sources of energy. Uh, that's going to be an important part. That's a resilience issue over time. Um, that, that 
uh, and in some so so that's an issue that we need to work out work on over time to make sure that communities um, can actually develop renewables and have some independent power sources um, that will serve as well. So climate resilience happens in on the family basis, on an individual basis, on a community basis, um, on a state basis, and it wouldn't it be nice if it happened on a federal basis. <laughs>
so that we can speak to those needs. Um, at the state level, we're doing that in a few different ways. First, in the climate legislation, we are working hard to address impacted communities. And I co-chaired a subcommittee last year to look at climate legislation and how we can make impacted communities as whole as possible through utility subsidies and looking at the transportation sector. Clearly, we need to do that. Um, clean energy, clean air um, Oregon was passed this past year. Um, it was in specific reference to some air pollution issues that have emerged in the city of Portland from glass factories. Those glass factories are very often along the freeways with vulnerable populations. We have passed standards to require greater regulation and to require those same entities to bear the costs of that regulation. So there are a number of different areas and we just have to pick them off one by one and understand that we reach out and pay special attention to vulnerable communities because very often um, we have not done that in the past. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is a super serious uh, topic and a lot of families have been exposed to toxins and we can't take that back. Uh, these people have uh, to live with the, the consequences and the, the after effects of pollutants uh, and pesticides. Um, I think of my stepdad who lived in a poor city in Ecuador and they put, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but chemicals in his bed to uh, keep away the the bugs, um, and you know he still has, um, you know, it's still affecting him to this day. Uh, so you know we have to protect our most vulnerable. We have to protect everyone, uh, and we need to make sure that the chemicals that we use are proven to be safe uh, before we start using them in our agriculture, um, in our streets, on our trees. Uh, we really need to make sure that everyone uh, primarily is, is kept safe from, from these. It's not, um, this isn't a topic that I, I've really thought about a lot and I'm really glad it came up and uh, I'm willing to work with people to make sure that everyone is, is kept safe. So thank you. I think in about 10 years, we're going to be looking back all over the nation and saying, why were we so casual about toxic use? Uh, why did we make the burden of proof fall on people exposed to toxins instead of the manufacturers and the companies? We don't know what the consequences are yet. They're, they're in the early stages. The, the environmental justice area in, our, in here is different from Portland. Here it has a lot to do with massive spraying of our farm and forest lands which are largely worked by uh, migrant workers, uh, you know, more Hispanic than Anglo. And their exposures, uh, a lot of people think they are intolerable exposures and are working very hard to increase spray-free buffers around housing, on uh, ag lands, and around workers. And that's been a struggle. We shouldn't have to fight to keep 50, 100, 150-foot buffers from farm worker housing or for people working in the field. And I believe, I, I really um, agree with the group Beyond Toxics. The responsibility for these rules should transfer from the Oregon Department of Agriculture, which is so influenced by the Farm Bureau and heavy users of toxics, to OSHA, which has a central mandate for human health. That would be an important start. We do need to take environmental justice uh, more seriously. And we need to make sure that substances like neonicotinoids, which are just hammering our pollinator populations, can only be applied by licensed people if we're going to use them at all, and not just by anyone who picks them up off the shelf at Walmart. So, gosh, heavy, heavy topic here. When I think about this issue and how our most vulnerable people are dealing with this, um, infrastructure really comes to mind, right? Um, you think about what happened in Flint, Michigan, you think about even some of parts of, of Oregon, what's happened in Salem with the water. Uh, we 
we have a habit of, in this country, of really um, investing in new things and not investing in old things and not investing in renewal, right? We really need to take a look at where are our most vulnerable people living and what does an investment strategy look like for making sure their infrastructure is in good shape. Um, some of that infrastructure was put in many, many, many years ago using technology that we would never use today. Um, you know, where the people are finding lead in their, in their water, right? That is unacceptable and we need to take a close look at what an investment strategy would look like. The problem that we have in Oregon is we keep, we keep sh you know, chasing this shiny thing all around, all the, the latest and greatest thing we want to we wanna work on and we forget about our responsibilities to take care of the, the, the things that exist already. And so what I would like to do is see a lot more fiscal responsibility, um, to see a lot more streamlining of administrative costs, and that will open up some opportunities for us to reinvest in, in those most vulnerable areas. All right, <clears throat> thank you. How's everyone doing? I feel like a little <laughs> deep breathing. Um, all right, audience question number four, and we will start with Ms. Blum Atkinson on this one. If you endorse clean energy jobs bill, how will you ensure investment banks and private interests cannot profiteer from aspects of a cap and trade system? I haven't heard this one before. <laughs> Uh, well, I would really want to make sure that the money goes to investments um, in infrastructure. I mean, that is what the policy that I've heard is proposing. Uh, and I want to see as much of the, uh, the money priced from the carbon and the emissions go into clean air projects, solar, wind, uh, and <laughs> I would not like to see it going into bank fees and, and third parties. So how would I make sure? I mean, I think we have to follow the money. We have to be very clear where the money is going and uh, make sure that it is going to where it is intended. If you endorse the Clean Energy Jobs Bill, how will you ensure investment banks and private interests cannot profiteer from aspects of a cap and trade system? It's a fair question that's super hard to answer because we're talking about an estimated $700 million a year by these fees. Again, who knows? Because we don't know how big the loopholes will be, how many, many emitters are going to be able to get waivers but a lot of money, and the ravens are going to circle banks and insurance companies and support companies. Um, that's what happens when there's a new revenue source in Salem. There, it, I don't think it's that hard to draw the law to talk about who's eligible to finance these projects, who does the lending, who handles the money. I, I would love to see a state bank of Oregon handle this money and have, uh, have any, any profits, if there are, plowed back into the program instead of sent off to Manhattan or wherever Citibank is located. Um, so um, that's, that's one parallel job that we have to do. But the problem isn't so much the design. You can write that law. It's uh, protecting it. It's the political will to resist those who say, uh, the legislators that I give money to will only vote for this bill if you drop that, this restriction on private banking getting involved. So what we're going to need is everyone who supports this approach to be talking to their, their members. This is not something legislators are going to pull off by themselves. This is something the people of Oregon can do. The people of Oregon are going to have to insist on an energy transition that puts resources where they need to go in the creation of new jobs and a new infrastructure and not to New York banks. So this gets to the essence of why I don't support this piece of legislation as it's um, being proposed is because I am really, really concerned about our state's ability to manage this process and make sure that we're not um, 
that we're not leaving ourselves open to fraud and waste when it comes to the money that's going to be. I mean, we are talking about 1.4 billion dollars over the course of a biennium. That is a lot of money. Uh, you know, we can't. We have a number of agency agencies that are just a mess right now. Look at what's happening with DHS. Um, and we think that we're going to be able to bring up this this new mechanism of sort of this complex financial trading activity and be able to regulate that property, uh, that properly. I I'm concerned about that and, and I would really want to see um, what that's going to look like and how we're going to handle that as a state um, if this goes through. You know, the other thing is, uh, thank, yeah, thank you, <laughs> 30 seconds left. Um, you know, the other part of that is, um, you know, we just, we are going to spend a, even if we're able to do it right, we're going to spend a tremendous amount of money dealing with this complex system and regulating this complex system. So we're going to lose a lot of money right off the top and we're not going to get to invest those dollars. I would rather take that money instead of wasting it in admin costs and invest it directly into things like water conservation and forest management. So I, I want to first just be really clear. You don't have that money unless you have cap and trade. That money is generated by a cap and trade system. It's not sitting there waiting to be spent. Um, and I want to reframe the whole conversation around how much money. Because we made a mistake, frankly, a year ago strategically talking about this and leading with the amount of money to be developed. Cap and trade is not a revenue generation bill. Cap and trade is intended to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, some revenue could be generated in the process of implementing it because we will have permits for emissions that can be bought on the market. That's where we might generate some of the income. But it's not going to be $700 million a year. Um, when we got further into the legislation last year, that became very clear. The $700 million a year was in all likelihood a gross overstatement. Um, and that's true for a number of reasons that probably aren't worth going into right now, uh, although I'm happy to answer questions later. In terms of our ability to manage money that's generated, I don't think there's any reason to think we don't have the, the capability to do that. We have a treasurer's office which handles um, a lot of money for our state retirement system and actually does a really good job investing it to make 15% last year. Whole another conversation. Um, we're going to have a tightly structured program. We can already model it after uh, California that's going to take a minimum of personnel to administer. And we're going to use that money in the very best ways that we can, targeted ways that will be delineated in the legislation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and in some cases to help us adapt to change. Okay, thank you. We are actually going to stop uh, with the audience questions there so that we keep uh, on time here tonight. So uh, it is now time for the candidates' closing remarks. Um, and you will have two minutes, and we will start with Ms. Gomez, I believe you're the next. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, i just like to say thank you all for being here and for staying and for being so engaged in this issue. Uh, I, I have so much... Um, love and humbleness um, for this community and I, I really just want to make sure that we're that we're fiscally sound and we can make those investments in our future I think right now our state uh, is struggling with our budget right we've had more I would say more revenue in the last two two bienniums than we've ever had in our state and we're still struggling to balance that budget and to pay our bills we really need to get back to being fiscally responsible and then we can tackle some of the big investments that, that we want to make. I'm really dedicated to working on education. Uh, we're 48th in the nation right now in graduation rates, which is terrible. We need to get our parents involved and we need to focus on, um, on more engagement and, and getting our teachers where they need to be and supported. Uh, also to looking at economic diversity, we have a very service-based industry right now in, in, our, in our region and we see how vulnerable it is year after year with the smoke, right? You think about uh, Brit Festival and, and a lot of our other amenities that are suffering um, for those dollars that they used to get over the summer. Uh, I also really want to work on poverty reduction. We have a lot of people um, that are in need in our community and we need to make sure that, that they have a path to success. 
which means better alignment of our safety net system so that work is a net positive. We have something called the benefits cliff in, in Oregon and all around the country. So if I'm a single mom and I start, um, maybe I'm reliant on some of those services, um, Medicaid or OHP, um, maybe I'm on SNAP or food assistance and I start to work, the first thing that happens is those things start to drop off very quickly. Um, and I can't afford to replace them with the money I'm making. We need to make sure that work is always in that positive and that will bring more prosperity overall to our state. Thank you. When I ran for state office two years ago, I'd go around the state and people would say, so what's, what are your priorities? What are you gonna work on? And I would say climate change at the top of the list. And I get this response, sort of this puzzled look, like we don't hear candidates who have climate change on the top of their list. But you know what, I never had that experience when I was here at home in my district because we all are seeing the impacts of climate change in front of us and we have been for some time in the form of turbulent storms and warming days and drought and reduced snowpack. Um, and I am, your enthusiasm and your passion for this issue fuel me when I go to Salem because I know um, that I'm reflecting the interests and passions of people in my community. I have been so grateful to represent you for the past two years. I think we've had some good accomplishments at the state level. We've stabilized our health care system. We passed a transportation package. We've done some very important criminal justice reforms that are really central to our community and the way that addiction tends to feed our child welfare and correctional system. We've addressed many different important things and I've been proud to be a part of that. And what we haven't done a super great job on is environmental issues in general, um, climate obviously being at the top of that list. I think we who care about these issues desperately need to continue um, to talk about them so that again, they move up, they move up, they move up, and pretty soon they're, they're at the top of this list. Um, there was a newspaper article in the Medford Mail Tribune in mid-August, I think it was August 15th, where it said scientists foresee five hot years ahead. And what the story was, was even with climate projections, even with those, the years ahead that we are, we are forecasting will be even hotter than we would have predicted um, when we look at the climate forecast. These are hard times. We need to take bold action. We are gonna need the votes from every legislator in Southern Oregon in order to pass climate legislation. And I will be proud to be there with those colleagues. We must take immediate action to defend our planet. This has to be a priority, and we really cannot afford to wait any longer. Uh, I am disappointed that my opponent didn't show up today because I think we all deserve to hear where she stands on these issues. So it's going to be really important that we all vote on November 6th. And we vote with this in mind, because we can't wait any longer. We have to make real change here on climate. We have to protect our planet for our sake and our kids' sake and our grandkids' sake, because we are running out of time. We can't just bury our head in the sand and pretend like this isn't affecting us because we can look outside and see the smoke and know that it is. So there's a lot we can do, but the most important thing is to vote on November 6th. Thank you. I wrote a book in 2003 called As If We Were Grownups that's about politics for grownups. And it imagines electing legislators who, before big votes, instead of asking themselves things like, what will my big funders think of this, ask themselves, of the choices available to me here, which are best for our children and our grandchildren? And I, I mostly had climate and environmental issues on my mind when I wrote that. And I wonder if there is anyone in this room who, reflecting on things, and the kind of life we've led, and the kind of trends we're facing now, who feels good about our stewardship and what we're handing off to the next generation. I, I, I doubt that there is. Maybe there is. I'm not one. It, it feels like we have 
consumed and extracted for our own uh, pleasure and convenience with very little, very little thought, not just to, to the seventh generation, to the third generation, second generation, our kids. And it's time, you know, it's, it's like, are we really going to look at them and say, hey, there was a great party, thanks a lot, you wouldn't mind cleaning up after us, would you? Good luck with that, bye. I don't think so. I think we're being called right now, the smoke is part of the call, to something different, to a different way of doing things. It is a matter, it's not just government, it's very much a matter of our personal habits and re retooling what's in our best interest and what we think of as convenient and doable. We have to, all of us, look at that in our own lives. But we also need really bold government strategy and policy that bucks especially the fossil fuel industry like we never have before. And it is true, it is completely true, we don't know, know exactly how this bill will work. We don't know exactly what the path is. But the house is on fire and we should not be debating on the front porch whether ceiling sprinklers or fire extinguishers are a better way to do it for the next 10 years. Uh, and there are some models, California's modeling. We're not starting from square one. Thank you very much for your attention and your passion to these issues. Thank you very much. So that concludes the candidate response component of our forum. Um, and uh, before handing the microphone back to Alan briefly, I'd like to pause so that we can offer the candidates a round of applause for attending and preparing for this forum.